So welcome, Julieta. You know that I'm a big fan of your work. Um, it's great to have you here in the reading group again. Um, and uh, yeah, you've, you've offered us a lot of really interesting things on the table, a sketch of you know, where your work is headed in the near future, as well as some, a, a text from uh, the recent past and, and some videos. And um, I, I thought I'd just start out with one question um, from Swimming in Rivers of Glue. Uh, which is about escape and um, thinking about the idea of the escape in the context of a pandemic and whether it's possible to escape a pandemic. I mean, of course not, right? It's like in the sense, um, uh, like the, the, the same very unsettling um, idea I, I keep getting about images of the future and this kind of like constant sense of projection. There is no future. We only have the present. I mean, like we can build a better present that incrementally becomes a future, but it's it's not that we can just, uh, I mean, there is, escap you know, there is escapism. Yeah, like, sure, we can do all kinds of escapism uh, from the pandemic and from whatever, from bad relationships and from bad families and from, you know, bad countries, whatever, but, uh, Escape now. Um, I mean, it's a it's a short answer. Sorry, I can elaborate as much as uh, um, one would want. I mean, like maybe because part of the problem is this, this like desire to escape. Yeah, like not this, uh, um, which is what I am interested in now when I think about what the subject constitution will be. Um, everything I have seen about. Um, you know, like when people are dealing with the pandemic, it's all about what it will be when either when we are out of this or when we go back to the way things were. But living with is really hard. Um, I mean, it's always very hard to be in the present. There is this kind of, um, I, I mean, like this is like super hippie, but um, there is this like um, um, belief that the present last six seconds, right? That that's like you're anchoring in time. Kind of like a, a bit of a, like a goldfish type thing. And then everything else is projections, either memories or idealizations. So um, in, in, I mean, like at the same time, you know, that, that there is this kind of, there's like, it's like a double bind, yeah? Because there is like a, like a sense of presentism, like uh, something that I have uh, thought about a lot is um, for the last years is that because we don't have, I mean, like there is like a lot of colonial impulses in the constitution of mankind as it is now. And the obviously we run out of space, like planetarily speaking, there is no more room. So the way of, dealing with that impulse is about time, hence all this thought about the future, how can we carve that into some known and how can we make that into a, you know, marketable, uh, profitable, speculative territory somehow. Um, and I mean, and when you couple that with a pandemic and with like ideas of a subject, this is like, it just feels like time is in a really like strange, discombobulated, fragile state. Um, that's what I'm trying to grapple with, and that's what I'm. That's the, the the videos that I sent you originally were supposed to be only three. I was not factoring in a pandemic and a radical change of um, um, things. So uh, I'm. I decided to work on a part four, which is. Um, but I took the liberty of uh, bringing in. But that's why. That's why I brought this to the to the reading group. Yeah, and maybe on that uh, new text, you know, you're, you're talking about uh, kind of the fascination with disaster and, um, you know, we're living a disaster and in some ways this reading group is all about kind of wrangling with the current lived reality of disaster. Um, so tornadoes, what, why, why tornadoes? <laughs> yeah, it was like there were tornado chaser. I mean, like I'm talking. This is uh, that. That's just what I, what I, you know, what I saw that uh, existing. It's, it's. I was not aware of of that as something I could give a name to. But then there were t tornado chasers, and and you know, like, and then they even like spawned that into movies. 
so it was like okay there is like this kind of like appetite it's not just like the wizard of Oz. there is like the this appetite to see things crumbling to see seeing you know we want to see sink calls and we want to, to get like a front row view to the end of things with without which is some kind of like an alibi or an excuse for some kind of um i mean it's like and again i'm like talking in terms of um what a collective subject may want or may do or you know like the the, the these impulses are uh, come from so it's it's something about i mean like it provides us with um sure you know we fill the oceans with personal protective equipment and uh, we fail to save you know whatever kind of species were dying and uh, there was a civil war and like everything went to shit but like you know it was the end of the world so it's it's some kind of like um of alibi i mean i think yeah. it, it's it's also interesting now because i mean like again there is a double bind yeah like the on the one hand this sense of territory and profitability from future speculation on the other hand, an appetite for disaster. And like, I see them like in, in some kind of like teeter-totter um, thing. And, and where you can even see the speculation um, uh, impulse profiting from the appetite for disaster. And, and then you get like a glut of dystopian science fiction movies. And, and dystopia gets, it's sold as some kind of like, you know, like um, um, keep keep calm and carry on. It's just the end of the world, but you can just, you know, just keep going by. And I mean, like, of course, you know, we've had a timeline for that and the timeline for that kind of disaster was some kind of like short-term profit. Uh, I mean, not so short-term, like 60 years, which is kind of like packed to glacier melting, like, you know, polar ice cap. That was like somewhat the benchmark um, timeline, and for Greta Thunberg and everything that came with it, and Fridays for Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion, and like everything is like was kind of like presented uh, with regard to eyes. I mean, like I'm thinking about uh, who is the artist Olafur Eliasson that brought uh, Glacier chunks to Paris for the climate uh, summit and so on, right? That was like our image of how it, how the world melts down basically. And then suddenly all of our time, time like, like that timeline was upended last year. And that changes things. And of course, you know, like the, the main impulse that I see is people trying to imagine, you know, what's, what will it be like when we are out of this? And what will it be like when we go back? Either when we get out or when we go back, but you know, what will it be like as we keep living with this? And that's, that's kind of like what I want to think about. Amina, I think your, your hand was up a moment ago. Yeah, thank you so much and for sharing this, this these works with us. Um, I, as I was watching, you know, these space knots with their heads connected to what looked like tormenting machines, um, it, it seemed like part of the the back narration is that um, this desire to fly, this desire to get beyond the body is part of the corrupting influence of the, the collective imagination. And so just now, as you were speaking about the fascination with the tornado chasing and the, the especially the large, not the holes that we've created, but the sinkholes, which in some senses we also have contributed to, um, but the tornado. Um, I wondered as you were speaking, if there isn't something that's attractive or alluring about these images because they speak a truth that actually we can't fly. We, we, we can't control the tornado. There, there's, it speaks a truth of limitation that we actually need if we're going to um, 
escape the escapism. Mm, makes sense, makes sense. I mean, we can't control the tornado or time or permanence. I mean, we are incredibly bad at uh, long durée, yeah? Like the, for all our um, colonial impulses, we can't re even read our own writing going back 300 years. It's all Ozymandias, you know? It's all kind of like this constant crumbling of the structures, concrete that gets eaten up by vegetation before the building is finished. I mean, that's kind of like the, the tragedy for, for a kind of um, construction. I mean, I don't want to call us a species. I want to call us a construction in this particular case for a construction that has this claims for achieving immortality and achieving all this kind of like permanence. We are so incredibly bad at things that go past a lifetime. I mean, like our cycle is a lifetime, maybe two if we are lucky, but I don't know if that we can build farther than like, you know, like anything concrete further than that. So it's, I mean, and that's where the sinkhole is, you know, and that's, I mean, it's, uh, and the, the fatigue of materials and, um, And you know, like the end point of imagination and so on. I mean, it's it's kind of like in that place. You know, it's like we keep thinking that we are going to talk to aliens, you know, and we can't even read our own hieroglyphs. I mean, I see the sinkhole and like as a kind of like time, and so it's it's kind of like compression there for me, not compression, but like um synthesis there. So, so in reading um, some of what you're saying about um, post-planetary capital, um, I was thinking about space as a, a place of evasion or like that it would be great for evasion in the sense of like- Tax you know, evasion, you mean, or? Any kind of evasion, right? <laughs> like, you know, you disappear behind an asteroid, you go for a ride on a comet. There's all kinds of ways that like the unintelligible is like around the corner. and. I, I'm wondering, you know, as as Elon Musk and others, you know, have this this dream of, of bringing capital to space, or you know, dreams are coming into contact with reality. Um, yeah, just possibilities of evasion, but also planetary evasion, and maybe returning to that question about escape. You know, I know you hate Slaughter Dyke, but uh, you know, I don't. He's, he's, it's don't. It's don't. <laughs> He talks about bubbles and bubbles you're and, you know, no like, slaughter like, no slaughter like. Right, but like there's there's these architectures of immunity that some of us can afford to build or or tactics of pandemic innovation, you know, those of us in Australia or, um, you know, there's, there's, there's ways of kind of ducking and hiding. And I guess I'm trying to think that together with modes of evading capital, both mm, on a terrestrial, scale and maybe oceanic, but also interplanetary. You know, I'm, I'm not interested in, in space fully. The, the reason to, to start from space was kind of like to do, um, to understand the desire and to understand the projection. But I, I'm, that's not what I'm, what I'm looking at at all. I mean, like I, I see that projection as, as uh, it's very telling and it's very faulty. Um, and um, I'm much more interested in like a post-planetary condition that already is in place here, you know, what's visible and what is invisible. And as we're talking about, you know, like there is, a, you know, like white flight and Australia and people that sing in balconies and talk about you know, how calming the pandemic is because they have time to reconnect with their children. And, and then you have realities that nobody talks about, you know, like there's like billions of people in third world countries, which are incredibly invisible, that, are, that have like a hand to mouth situation and can't afford to spend four months hunkered down anywhere. Yeah? Like they, they, I mean, this like, people that work today for what they will eat tomorrow and that's that. 
so I mean, and I mean, my home country is one of those countries. So of course, I'm super sensitive to this kind of like idyllic imaginary of like how we are taking a rest from capitalism, because that's on the backs of the invisible people again. And and that's what I'm. I mean, like I'm super concerned about that. And like that's part of like, but like when I refer to the limits of representation, it's not only visual representation in like a strictly artistic sense is what we get to see and what for reasons that range you know from the from the things that we know to the things that we want to know to to you know to whatever it may be that we don't see i mean like i, I remember this was like last year already when when people were talking and we already discussed this you know when people were talking about like all these like tragic images of uh, trucks in bergamo italy coming around with like corpses which indeed was incredibly tragic um there were people leaving their relatives outside in the street in ecuador um in guayaquil just like simply because there was no room at home and there was you know like nothing to do but usually would leave them outside in the street on the hope that, that somebody would pick them up sometimes uh <laughs> Uh, shrink wrapped sometimes just like that and those images made it nowhere nobody saw them i mean i saw them because like i i care about that stuff but that's that that that's part of the limits of representation um and the kind of like space and um um you know like the kind of like subjectivity that the virus is creating which which is why i decided to make a fourth part to this like a uh, series of works uh, I mean, I was like, I think I was like thinking before of, in a very precise way about the limits of representation, thinking of the visual and the things that we kind of like the limit point of imagination, what can we imagine and what simply exceeds us. And it just hit an incredibly concrete um, uh, place of which has, uh, which, which goes beyond thinking in terms of images so that's uh, i mean i mean that's like and in that sense i'm actually like not so much interested in talking but in hearing if uh, if anybody has uh, thoughts or ideas um about this Eleanor, do you want to jump in there um, I'll, I'll try, but I have a baby who just had vaccines in the morning, so he might start crying again at any moment. Um, I mean, what I posted is just a side note that I remembered when you said like we can't read um, hieroglyphs. There's this quite fascinating um, into like group group of. I mean, I'm not sure how active they still are. They're all quite old guys, but like African writers and historians who have this hieroglyphic study group, and they put out um, a book. I don't know. Might just might be might be interesting to look at. Um, but I was more wondering about, um, you know, disaster as design. What about the design of people who constantly live with disaster? I mean, all the all the people living in the global south who like currently are hit by disaster, the colonized who, you know, have been hit by this accumulated violence of of cap of um, sorry, colonialism that you write about, who aren't included in that us. Um, that, that the text is written from, but I mean, I don't know, maybe you want to say more about that, that strategy of writing because it, you're like kind of like constantly referring to that universal us, but also- I mean, I doubt, you know, I really doubt that universal us. I mean, the, the like, especially coming from the global South and like, you know, like, and, and from the very non-privileged global South and like seeing this, um, you know, like this, uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I never say this uh, outright, but obviously I'm writing and doing all my work from that place of where I doubt this, uh, um, like everything from like the construction of um, understanding and, um, you know, like understanding the problems of others. And like, the, it's like, I mean, like, 
I mean, it's of course, again, this double bind where to go into the place where you can understand your own problems, you have to go into the place of people that are understanding the problems of others. And you go there as one of us, but you're actually one of the others. So it's it's a very schizophrenic place to live in. Um, that's what passing is. Um, and most, I don't address that directly, but most of what I do is from that place of uh, where I doubt whenever somebody that has never lived that reality talks to me about us. I doubt that place. And I and when I use the word us, it's very often ironically. I mean, like I don't explain it properly because it feels like I, I'm not very didactic, don't want to be. But um it's yeah, it's that kind of um I mean I doubt what us means. I, I don't, you know, like if, if we are going to talk about us, we would first, we would have to start with like a definition of the term, I think in any kind of uh, situation. If that makes sense. Sure, yeah, thanks. Back, back to the idea of um, like these post-human forms of capital or post-planetary, I'm I'm also wondering, like, you know, the juxtapositions you're making between Hairway Cyborg, you know, the ghost money being burned burned at funerals in Hong Kong. Um, I'm I'm wondering about modes of 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 being, modes of enactment, uh, mechanisms of coordination and control that are kind of post capital. You know, if if the capitalist is is the the person that gets personified by capital where you know capital possesses the capitalist to make more of itself i can imagine a an ai um like in that movie uh, i am mother where you know there there's a robot and you think it's like bad robot or you know maybe good robot and there's bad robots but then you realize that they're all kind of different bodies of the same coordinated thing like a ai that's multiply embodied so I guess I'm wondering what, like, as you're thinking about post-planetary capital, post-human capital, are the machines going to abandon capital at a certain point? It seems like it'll just be like, you know, like there's machines that go to war for like um, in the robot games and they spin around and hit each other and try to disable each other. And I wonder, like, what are the things that robots might want to do besides make money? You know, I don't. I don't think of the robots very seriously, like or of AI very seriously, because it's all projection land. Um, it's it's all kind of. Um, I mean, I or I understand it as part of that, like this same impulse for prolongation and for extending ourselves beyond our own limitations and so on, but with zero imagination as to what that extension may be. So it's like, I mean, sure, let's have slaves again. Yeah, yay, bring on the AI. I mean, you know, I have like no, no serious consideration. I mean, like, I don't think that this is like any kind of like breakthrough towards um, an emancipatory project. And like, and I'm even like wary of emancipatory projects because they never take into account the environment. They only take into account humanity. So it's like all is fair game as long as there is some kind of like emancipation happening. Like, and we just like burn like, you know, like 3000 acres of forest in the Amazons, but we got emancipation, yay. So it's it's all kind of like really delicate in, you know, as trying to understand what kind of sense, not what makes sense, but what kind of sense do we want to make? I mean, you know, AI is like, AI, it all looks, I just like imagine robots that look all like Elon Musk. Yeah, like it's horrible. And like they're trying to put chips on pigs or on monkeys or like whatever. I mean, it's, it's just like, it's, it's, it's lame. I mean, it's advancement, but it's like really lame advancement. I don't want to, you know, like I want to go forward in other, in other directions, not there. Yeah, in part I was curious about just telos, like uh, ways of thinking about like 
like direction, like intentionality or, or aims or like, you know, capital is one kind of telos or like, you know, Stinger's talks about capital as like the en endlessly tolerant, you know, spirit that's out there that'll inhabit any subject or position, any values. It's a fantastic parasite. Um, I mean, it's like, it's like the best parasite. It's, it's like that, you know, that kind of, um, in the last video that I uh, made, there is this uh, parasite that invades a snail and makes it go towards the sun, which is something that the snails don't do because it dries their slime, so that the bird can pick him up and eat him and propagate the parasite. And I always think, you know, when I think of, um, of what position we and capital may play, I don't think about the snail, I think about the parasite. Yeah, like that's kind of like this. I mean, the like capital is this fantastic parasite, the most fantastic parasite. I'd agree. <laughs> um, other folks, feel free to jump in. I, I get to talk to Julieta all the time. Um, I've got lots of other questions. And, and some, maybe I'll ask one more um, like really specific question. So in swimming in rivers of glue, we see a lot of folded proteins. And right now my screen stopped on one where we- A lot of what you said? Uh, folded proteins, like mm -hmm. molecular models. And um, in part, I'm curious about the play of scale. You know, we're tumbling through the stratosphere with an upside down astronaut. And then, you know, we're, we're down on the level of proteins, but also I'm just, curious about which which proteins these are um it's, it's fox p2 fox p2 okay which is uh, supposedly um at, like at the core of where, where language comes from and the work is like trying to make a case for going from like outer space to inner space it's kind of like a, it's built on a zoom level yeah like the so I start dealing with um, outer space and I give a hint that then I'm going to go to one-on-one -on -one space in swimming in rivers of glue. It's all about architectural relationships and one-on-one -on -one space um, heading towards interior space. The third part is about um, kind of like unrepresentable space. And then I just realized that the fourth part is about full-on subjectivity, whatever kind of space that is. So it's in a way, it's like a zoom, you know, like zoom in model. So tell us more um, I mean, I was like, I was like super interested in like uh, when I was making the work, there was like a lot of hoopla about like Fox P2. And then I was like thinking about the, you know, like the, the impositions on language and how land, language makes human and, and so on, which is not something that I believe, but it's something that, it, that I wanted to look into. And also, you know, like what language means in terms of, um, um, you know, like, I mean, like at the same time that we keep saying that language makes human, um, then we know that like the vast majority of uh, languages and dialects are um, disappearing. So it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of like an iffy territory. Uh, so, and Stephanie, you've got your hand up, and Amina, you've also got a, a question in the chat. Um, somebody wanted to the the sound. Okay, um, in in the second film, when I made the second film, I was pregnant, so the entirety of the sound of the film is uh, contact microphones um, recording my body sounds and the heartbeat of my child and my own heartbeat and so on, and. Um, um, everything like the other two films is I, I do my own sound editing and I do really layered um, um, compositions is a pretentious word but um, I do layered soundscapes let's say um, with sounds that are pertaining to just about every like the, everything that appears in the videos somehow. And Stephanie, do you want to ask ask your question? Yeah, so I, I watched the three videos. I love them. They, I found them. You have weaved together so much rich data in a very uh, artistically compelling way. So I found it fascinating. And 
and you you seem to gesture towards the fact that how uh, humanity has reached a threshold and uh, it's completely unsustainable the way how we live and it, this is brought forth by uh, environmental uh, climate change and also the pandemic and there is the, either the biological um, reverse engineer yourself route ourselves route or uh, the AI route so I, I, I found those videos extremely uh, compelling and regarding to the to the text um, on excess output on page what was it four uh, you talk about take for example the institutionalized person who has to surrender her digital devices and forced mm -hmm. to interact only with her real friends even though her relationships are dependent on being able to reach them through the very same devices being taken away so i was wondering how do you define um the digital versus the physical is like the digital scene as unreal and and the physical scene as real uh, no so can you can you tell a little bit about is this digital friendship is there's a simulation and then and also uh, the following sentence uh, about a heteroaffective other I found that very uh, interesting so can you tell a little bit about affect in relation to digital yeah just let me let me get that um, page here So I mean, like, something that I, I've been I've been hoping for a kind of like psychoanalytical theory builds upon that that um, like an update because we like when I think of digital devices and digital mapping a digital representation, I don't think that it's unreal. Yeah, like um, I mean, like we we know it's not unreal. Well, you know, teenagers have killed themselves because they get bullied online. Yeah, it's it's. Um, it's a bit like that Ibsen play where, or like being a drone operator where, you know, if you are killing somebody by drone, did you kill them or not? You didn't shoot them with your own hand, you didn't see them, but you, you still kill them. So I don't think of it as an unrelated like space at all. I just don't think that it's well mapped because it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's, um, it's something that we don't know very well yet. And how could we? I mean, it's, it's, it's new. So, so, so that, that, that the digital would be another manifestation of the real or slash the virtual is another form of the real. I mean, we it's kind of like a tesseract. Yeah, like, yeah, sure. We just uh, opened up this kind of like dimensional thing and we are interacting in it. So as long as we are there and we are interacting and we are, you know, we are buying things. So when your Amazon delivery shows up, is it real? Yeah. So it's, you know, like that it's, it's, uh, you know, did the money get deducted from your bank account? Even if you, you never, you know, we don't use bills anymore. We pay digitally. So is it real? Yeah. So it's, it's, but it's very convenient to dismiss it as not real because it allows for a lot of leniency in terms of what we do, how do we react to things that are represented only on that space or that don't, so... I was thinking a lot about that when, uh, like, and thinking of about it in terms of like uh, psychoanalysis, because I found that um, digital devices hold this very particular status as um, tra um, transitional objects. Yeah, like they are akin to the um, to that baby blanket or that toy that you drag around for comfort. It's not just a device; it contains, you know, it contains realities, especially now that we are so separated and that um, that's, that was one of the reasons to, to use that particular text uh, uh, for this, because we, our public space disintegrated and we are, on, we are dependent on digital connection. So is this real? You know, like that, that's, that's how we, I mean, like, that's how I talk to my child. Is it real? I haven't seen my child for a month. We see each other on Zoom. Is it real? Of course. Is, he is my child. He didn't disappear. So it's uh, it's just the kind of space that we don't that we don't have jurisdiction well framed for. That we don't have. Uh, I mean, like when I when I think about it, it's a kind of um, toddler. It's like a mirror. You know, we have been dealing with mirror stage. Like if we think about um, um, our digital self developing. So our digital self is a little bit past a toddler at the moment. 
and we get past the mirror stage and this kind of like playground bullying and so on. And so how do we constitute ourselves as digital subjects, understanding that it's not that it is part of who we are, but it's not the same as, as, as how we are. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah, if that, I mean, I could go on and on, but that's kind of like the gist of it. Thanks. That's great. Thanks. Since, since you're gesturing towards um, pandemic subjectivity in, in this um, uh, uh, sort of sketch of, of a text for the new video, um, I thought I'd give a blast from the recent past, especially since Caitlin's on the line. So she shared a text with us um, last summer um, and I'll just read part of it. Um, Living together with a virus is a lonely way of being. As my peers individuated from deep dependent adolescence into adulthood, my coming of age was not as a single singular human subject. I was already multiple, a human carrying an alien viral load. My subjectivity was shaped by an awareness of having been seated and colonized by an undead thing, an endless genetic proliferation with no known purpose other than to repeat itself. Um, so I was just, yeah, you know, we're, we're now living with a different kind of viral subjectivity. It's a, a, a subjectivity. I mean, you know, some of us in the Zoom room probably have been infected and others have now been vaccinated. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, how, but the, how you know there is also fear. You are forgetting fear in that kind of sure, situation. Sure. I mean, like there is infection and then there is, um, you know, vaccination and then uh, permeating all that is fear. And loneliness, I think, mm -hmm. too, in the pandemic. This is also what, what Caitlin was, was uh, grappling with in, in that text. So I'd love to just hear your, your thoughts, you know, in, in response to Caitlin on, on pandemic subjectivity and, you know. Uh, I mean, like, I, you know, I mean, like, you know, like the, the, the one thing that, why I started thinking about um, collective subjectivity very precisely, not individual subjectivity, is because, if the commons were endangered, I mean, like if my public space now is a Zoom room, which is a private uh, for-profit company, then like the commons are in like in in they kind of like need some reimagining. You know what is our common space? What is like that room that we grow towards? If if we are essentially afraid of each other, and and and. And for reasons of preservation, yeah, like I mean, like I was thinking, and like I think I was like asking you that, like before, Evan, like you know, like um, you know, what animals would be able to resist the like primates, especially, you know, like gregarious animals. What animals would be able to resist the the, the pull for conviviality and being together in order to protect themselves and and remain, and you know, so and you know, like that's uh without bells and whistles that's like that's like the problem that we are at right now and that's like i mean of course there are like these like horrible people that are um doing like lateral thinking and uh, marches and things like that which i mean like i i hate them all on the one hand on the other hand i think well we're just monkeys that want to hang out together and and i understand that's what we do and that's how we build whatever we have built, good or bad. So um, this kind of like uh, against our own nature in the you know, prescriptive impulse now of like, okay, you need to be afraid of everybody else if you want everybody else to stay alive, not only yourself. Stephanie, do you want to jump in with a question? I'm sorry, I'm like the worst kind of attendee. I attended late and it's very early here, so I'm a little bit- That's all okay. <laughs> I'm trying to get, but I wonder, so, I mean, you know, there is also, a, I mean, there are also certain kinds of pathogens or parasites. I hate this, uh, the terminology. I wish we had, I'm trying to come up with better terms, right, to, to, to describe these kinds of relationships, but but you know, there, um, as you were describing, right, the, the 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 whatever it was that got the snail to go out into the sun, which kills the right, which which dries up the snail, but then gets the bird to eat it. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, like to me, our modes of sociality, like thinking about us as naturally social, mm -hmm. seems like um, 
a multi-species um, phenomenon and right and and that at many of our different modes of sociality and um, inclinations to to socialize in this way or in that way or not to socialize can sometimes be the result of um uh, i wish i could remember caitlin's brilliant uh phrase right that's something that lives inside me like that has you know some but but they don't they also they don't, they don't just control our body sometimes they also uh seem to influence our affections and mm -hmm, i wonder mm -hmm. if that changes your your thinking at all um oh, well, i mean this is this is this is something i have worked with before the the um, you know like of course you know like you only you're only going to fall in love with someone that your gut biome likes this is that's that's just the way it goes you, you know you go on a tinder date with some incredibly on the screen hot person and then you meet and you're like, oh, I'm not in the least attracted to you because my bacteria don't like your bacteria. And that's as, as you know, and then you are attracted to some like mysteriously um, person, you know, like person that you normally would think, okay, that's not in my book of attraction, but you know, like my God's talking. Yeah. Like, uh, and I mean, like, it's no accident that we have all this like uh, God feeling and, and, you know, and, and, I mean, like, of course, that's, that's, I mean, like, that's an intense part of our I mean, like, we are matro, I mean, but, but we know this, yeah, and I know we know this. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not starting from there. We are matroshka dolls. I mean, like, that we know. Um, but beyond being, you know, like, in, in, in the, in the, if we are looking at all, at, at ourselves as matroshka dolls, we are at a kind of like a, like, one of the bigger matroshka dolls, so we cannot see what contains us, in a sense. So, um, what do we do with the kind of sociality that we are impulsed to have beyond what our God commands us to do when we are drunk at the bar? You know, like the. I mean, like I, you know, I want to see my mom. You know, I want to see my friends. I want to. I want to hug people. I'm like. Uh, I'm also culturally Mexican, and I. Uh, we are like uh, famously touchy yeah like I want to touch my friends and like hug them and 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 I can't because I need in order to protect them I need to be afraid of them and that is a really hard impulse that's why, why I I mean like I hate all these like anti-corona demonstrators but I also understand their monkeys talking yeah like and I'm like yeah you're like horrible Trump supporter but I like I don't despise your monkey. I, I despise your political inclinations. You are muted, Stephanie. I was just, I, I was, because I wasn't sure if I was going to say anything or not, but now I am. So here goes. I mean, it, it's kind of, it's interesting, you know, I'm a political theorist. So that's interesting to me, right? That it's, that it's the Trump supporters um, who are on, on some level, um, right? Um, giving, um, uh, being faithful to or um, honoring, oh, that's not really what I want to use. Um, <laughs> dealing with their monkey. I mean, like, let's say dealing with their monkey in a way that they can logically control. But but it's also, but, 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 that, but that that is joined to this kind of politics is, is, is fascinating. Um, no, but but it's, it's fascinating and it's as old as humanity. Yeah, like I'm like also thinking about like how we dealt with the plague and how we dealt with the Spanish flu and you know, and, and there were like these like moments of despair and where people were like tired of like holding away from their monkeys or whatever, you know, and just, you know, like uh, ring around the posy and let's just have this kind of like, uh, or when you think about like post parties, you know, where people that have been like so afraid of getting like HIV infect, just go and say like, okay, let's just deal with this. And then let's just get back to a kind of, uh, uh, normal life. I mean, I you know, I, I hate that this travels around um, political lines because it takes, it's impossible, it does not let us see it as a, as a kind of like another kind of impulse. You know, I want to hold my friends. I, I, I want all of that, you know. Did you have a follow up, Stephanie? I thought I saw your mouth moving, but. 
Um, so Caitlin says, I'm on a bike, it's sorry. Bike, yeah. yeah, I hope you're enjoying. I kind of want to see the uh, the live video feed as, as you're biking through uh, Berlin and just listening to this. That, that must be a different sort of pandemic subjectivity. Um, let's see, so I don't know, what, what actually would be helpful for you, Julieta, to think about? So, so you're workshopping this, this new piece with us. Um, I mean, I mean like, what I'm trying to imagine is what, this, what this, the construction of a subject, both um, individual subject, a collective subject, a political subject, will be not living past the pandemic, but living with the pandemic. Because I don't, I mean, like, much as as we would want to think, you know, I've been like reading texts about what it will be like once we are done with this, you know, like, will we go back to Casablanca and will we, will, will we be able to fall in love? And it's like, well, we are not getting past this. So how will we live with? And this living, you know, and it's not going to be, um, I mean, like the, this, Tools for sociality. I don't know how long are we going to be able to to keep them in check. Yeah, like um, I mean, we you know, people reproduce. Teenagers want to get late. I mean, like it's you know, like things like that. Yeah, like so, it's a bit. It reminds me a little bit like what it was in the nineties. You know, like coming of age with fear of AIDS. Yeah, and we're thinking, okay, so how am I going to have sex? We, so it's, and that shaped the subjectivity for a good at least 15 years um, of like, you know, like fear and longing and wanting and not wanting and so on. So I'm like trying to imagine what will it be like? So I'm just curious to know, um, you know, what, what the images, what, what comes to mind. So I think we can draw a formal parallel between the queer barebacking culture that Tim Dean talked to us about um, last summer and the Trump supporters who are like letting out their inner monkey, right? So, so in, yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's like certain modes of sociality right now that are probably, you know, really joyful, right? And very, um, and, and I mean, it's not just the, the I, I think there's a particular articulation of like, I don't believe that the virus is going to kill me. Maybe it's all a hoax, and you know. Um, but 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 there's also um, you know a big part of that is that this virus doesn't make most people sick, and um, yeah. But I guess that form of parallel I'm trying to draw between the queer barebacking subculture that that Tem Dean describes so eloquently in Unlimited Intimacy. You know, it's 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 a mode of of just like abandon and and sort of a celebration of pleasure over health. And you know, what what might we celebrate over biopolitical norms? What might we celebrate over? You know, the the, the Black Lives Matter moment was, I think, one clear moment uh, last year and and ongoing right now. And um, you know, I mean. We all came out, you know, like my, my one outing last year, my one social outing um, last year was for a Black Lives Matter march. You know, masked and afraid and so on. And also giddy of sociality, yeah? And I don't want to, it's not about social responsibility. I mean, like, yes, it's social responsibility and that like moment trumped my fear, but I was also excited about seeing people and, and, and you know, and there were other humans and, and they saw my friends and you know we talked and it was like heavy and, and beautiful. And it was not like a drudge, you know, like something like I'm, I'm just doing this because I must, because I have political convictions. I, I was gen I genuinely, be, beyond the fear, I enjoyed being with people. So, I mean, like, unless we're like a, a misanthrope and, and there are those, of course, um, you know, there is, it's this kind of like coming together is, it's not just duty. I mean, we can't just think, you know, like, and that's why, I mean, like, that's why I'm like, I've been thinking about like what the summer is going to be. Yeah, like I'm kind of like a little bit afraid of the summer because people, like at least in the Northern hemisphere, 
people are not so social in the winter because it's cold. But in summer, they all take their shirts off and, and go outside and drink in parks and they are pissed. People are upset now. Yeah, like, and that's part of like the building of this immediate uh, collective subject. Like this, that collective sub subject right now, it's really angry. Um, does not need to be a Trump supporter to be upset. Yeah, like, but it's angry because it's been kept away from things, life, its relationships, like immediacy, um, intimacy, um, touch. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I, I, I like, you know, like in um. Like um, the pessimistic part of me is like seeing a lot of like um, political upheaval in the coming months. Once it's warm and people can like go, you know, like get that pool to go out on the streets and demonstrate and, and protest uh, full on. Can I say that in engaging with some of this part of your archive of work that I hadn't engaged with before, um, my mind went to a much darker, <laughs> you know, scenario with, um, you, you know, like as as you're talking about these um, new subjectivities of, of nationalism, and you know, we're living in this moment of of radical disinformation that hasn't been seen before, really, right? With the proliferation not only of you know Twitter, Facebook, but all Parler and Signal and all these other channels, um, it's not too impossible to imagine you know a, a, a nuclear event <laughs> in this this moment. I mean, like, look at the shootings. You know? I, I I keep thinking that this is like the end of the world, and we, because we are like so future oriented, we don't see it. Yeah, like the, my my pessimistic self thinks that. And then I'm like, well, no, I have a five-year-old, so I better work hard on building a building world, like whatever that takes. But you know, like when I think about like all this dissent and all that anger, I don't want to separate to just turn those people into political units, like political ammunition. Yeah, like I, I but to say I can't separate them from their monkeys. Yeah, like I'm like I understand why you want this thing. Yeah, like. Uh, deluded, horrible, racist, obnoxious person. I understand why you want this thing. Be, you know, so it's... Uh... And at the same time, it's not the event, right? Like this is what Povinelli reminds us. And I know that- you... I mean, like, what do you mean by the event? Well, I mean, so what we see are ongoing processes that are sabotaging infrastructures for living. That's that's what Tony Hatch shared with us last year about the ne necropolitics of the pandemic in the States. But, you know, like Melanie's seeing this close at hand, right, in, in Johannesburg. Like, you know, other people in this room are, are seeing that ongoing sabotage. Not, like, there's not gonna be the definitive, like- No, I mean, like the event is the pandemic it. itself, right? I mean, like, that is, an event that as one would never have wished to see. And, and it's there and it's shaping things and subjectivities. And then you just like think, okay, there are children that have never seen other children. You know, there are kids that, uh, that pandemic kids have never played with another kid. And, you know, like, like in, I mean, like, it's like an up ending of, of what we know. And there are like this, like, Corollaries and these like little moments that look like events but are not events, because like the main the, the event is is this thing that is like completely outside of our control and we just keep I mean like, we keep reacting and I mean like, I wish people could react intelligent intelligently yeah and but you know that I I also want to understand where the reactions come from and and try to see like beyond you know like also I mean like how do we react to this without only protecting ourselves? I mean, like protecting ourselves at the expense of the world is what brought us here. So that's maybe not the way to go about it. You know, when you keep reading about like the, the kind of like, um, how many, like how many tons of uh, PPE are in the ocean right now? It's like, yeah, maybe this is just adding fuel to the fire. I mean, I don't, I mean, it, I, I mean, I'm trying to like grapple not how to live past, but how to live with and what that subjectivity looks like. And, and 
and is that subjectivity shaped by fear or is it beyond fear? You know, is there a way to live with that is, uh, that is not like the abandon of a post party, but a kind of, uh, because I'm not going to bring my kid to a post party. I may bring myself, but not my kid. Yeah. Like, but, so if we are thinking about a society, like in terms of a society, like what would that be like? If it is not going to be shaped by fear. I think that's an excellent note to end on li living with is kind of the ongoing problematic of it's not going to be the post pandemic times, but the ongoing the pandemic times for the duration. Yeah, we have one person who's joining for the last minute. Um, so someone's probably an hour late. So um, uh, thank you, Julieta, for sharing this amazing archive of work with us, for uh, also sharing, you know, it's, it's uh, not always easy to share something before it's made and you've uh, trusted the group with um, a, a, a new text. So thank you. And um, also want to let folks know that um, next week, um, I think it's, let's see, it's quite late. I think it's 1 a.m. in uh, Berlin. Um, I think it's a more reasonable hour, like 6 p.m. in the East, East Coast of the U.S. Um, we're going to be uh, discussing the new WHO report um, in conversation with a bat coronavirus specialist, uh, Gary Crameri, who um, has actually been to the Wuhan Institute of Virology and is part of an international network of folks who've been studying coronaviruses for, for decades now. Um, we'll also have um, Lyle back, author of Vir Virulent Zones, um, as well as Christos, who was, who was just here um, recently. And um, we'll be reading some of Gary's original uh, research about bat coronaviruses, as well as this latest uh, WHO report. So um, see you next week, if, if you can make it, if it's not a crazy time zone. But yeah, thanks. Thanks again, Julieta. Thanks, Rachel, for all the work and holding space. And, Thank you, um, Rachel and Evan. This was actually yeah. important to me. Thanks, Julieta. Yeah. It was great. See, see you in a Zoom room sometime soon. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.